Suffolk County District Attorney Rachel Rollins is our guest this morning. It's time to go on the record. She made history as the fight against crime meets calls for social justice. Can the law enforcement community come together in a time of passion and protest? We asked the DA, let's go on the record. From WCVB Channel 5, the inside word from Washington to Beacon Hill. Today's newsmakers are going on the record. And thank you for joining us. I'm Ed Harding along with New Center 5's political reporter Janet Wu. August quickly moving along and we are pleased to welcome to our studio this morning the Suffolk County District Attorney Rachel Rollins and as you can see we're all observing the social distancing protocols in this time of COVID-19. DA Rollins is serving her first term taking office in January of 2019. She is the first woman of color to hold that position. It's great to have you with us. Thanks for coming in. You, you bet. Thank you. Happy Sunday to you. Um, you as well. Both Mayor Walsh and the police commissioner, Willie Gross, say that they hear the protesters demand for change in police procedure and Walsh and Gross have made some changes. Have they gone far enough? And if not, what still needs to be done? I think there has definitely been movement by the mayor. Uh, he reduced the overall budget of the police, the Boston police uh, from 414 million, remember, and 60 million with respect to overtime. Uh, but he only reduced it on the overtime side, which is a much smaller pot of uh, money. I think 20% on the oversight time, as opposed to a 10 or 20% on the um, operational side, the $414 million. Um, but we should be proud that there's $12 million that are going to be going to more community-based uh, organizations or the Boston Public Health Commission, for example. Um, I think they have also been good at trying to listen to what the protesters are saying and being a bit more transparent, but I think there's more we can do. What, what, give me an example, one or two examples of what they should be doing and that they have not yet. So I think, for example, um, we, the mayor put together a group of individuals that are considering uh, civilian review boards for the police. Um, but I want to make sure that, you know, we have seen things where I think the pendulum has swung too far, where people have completely um, either refused to fund the police at all. Um, I don't think that is what we need to do here in Boston. But I do think a $414 million budget is excessive, and we've been asking the police to do far too much. So the mayor could also um, be a little bit more transparent, and I think he's going to be, about the four upcoming collective bargaining agreements with respect to the Boston police um, unions. They have four different unions, um, and uh, collective bargaining is a huge deal uh, it, with respect to management and unions. Mm -hmm. There have been discussions in our state legislature, for example, of removing discipline from uh, the collective bargaining world uh, with respect to police and their unions. So I think the mayor can um, has a lot of power. And quite frankly, with an upcoming mayoral race, I think the community needs to be really focused on what it is that's happening with those collective bargaining agreements. So you have a, a list of 15 nonviolent crimes that should not be prosecuted. In fact, we're going we're gonna to list them on. We'll put some of them on the screen. This, this isn't all of them, but this is some of them. And as we get into this next topic, during the pandemic, many police departments followed this list to avoid unnecessary contact with people. I'm going to ask these questions in stages. But first of all, did, did Boston do that? Did, did Boston do it? Yes. That? So can we repeat that, please? Uh, in the middle of the global pandemic, everyone essentially started utilizing my list of 15 where remember ed it's not that we don't prosecute even though i know it says do not prosecute it's that the presumption has changed the presumption from jail or prosecution is now to potentially diversion which mm -hmm. all of those presumptions are rebuttable meaning with a supervisor's oversight we can always say no you know what ed has done this seven times in the last year whereas janet has only done it once in her life mm -hmm. let's move forward with ed and let's give janet find out what the root cause of that problem is and, so, and, and so yes boston did implement what they started doing was they were no longer going to walk up to ed and say you're trespassing we're arresting you right let's bring you to the to the uh, police B2, for example, right, right. what they did was issue a summons and the summons might even say, 
We'll see you at a later date when we know when the courts are open. Um, so I am happy that it only took a global pandemic for people to acknowledge that my, my, my policies actually um, should be implemented. Okay, but, so, so, so that begs the question, how hopeful are you that this will continue when the pandemic itself is is over and it will we, be? We'll see. And But I do want to say the police were arresting people, right? But they were only arresting individuals for violent and serious crimes. Just because we were in a global pandemic didn't mean crime stopped. You know, we will hopefully be talking later, unfortunately, about the rise in some shootings in Boston and homicides in Boston. Um, but again, we did not see things deteriorate when individuals were summoned or told to come to court later. Um, we are going to be looking at that data, and I've been in constant contact with Commissioner Gross to see whether or not some of these things could continue to be implemented or whether we're going to revert back to what we did in the past. So um, you have stopped prosecuting people charged with violating these 15 crimes, at least for now. And right. so it's Jan very likely that they'll be dismissed or ignored permanently? So the courts were not open. And remember, we are right. one cog in a wheel of the criminal legal system. Um, I have a lot of autonomy and power, but I don't control the trial court. So when, for example, after the, uh, after the governor issued uh, a state of emergency, the courts essentially closed except for emergency matters. So for example, we had a homicide on April 15th, an arrest was made that day, the arraignment happened uh, the following day, April 16th. That is an emergency. Mm -hmm. The court was actually open for that even though some people zoomed in, some people called in, and some people physically presented themselves uh, in that courthouse. But they aren't going to open for a trespass. They would open, my hope is, of course, for a domestic violence restraining order or something like that. Um, but I couldn't even prosecute, even if I wanted to, because the court was saying we aren't hearing anything but the violent and serious crimes. Those were executive orders or orders from the trial court um, or the Supreme Judicial Court uh, Chief Justice Gantz. Um, I want to switch over to the question about violent crimes, which you mentioned a little bit earlier. Commissioner Gross has attacked judges and prosecutors for letting criminals back on the street, leading to an increase of violent crime. The murder rate in Boston is now significantly higher than the last, last year at this time. What's your response to the commissioner on this? I think the commissioner has a good point. You know, we had a 30-year all-time low in 2019. We had 40 homicides total in 2019, and for 30 years we had never been that low. Um, this year, right now today, we have had 41 homicides in Boston alone, right? And total 43, uh, because we had one in Revere and we had one on state property, which the Boston police do not investigate. Our state police investigate mm -hmm. that. So I am, um, you know, working around the clock with the commissioner, with the colonel, and with my four other chiefs of police in Suffolk County to make sure that we are not just reacting to violence, but we are proactively trying to disrupt violence before it happens. And, um, you know, I think the commissioner is right. There are some legitimate concerns that people have regarding being held pretrial, for example, and there's another word for that. They're, those people are innocent because they have not been proven guilty yet. If we are sending you to a place where you are more susceptible to, to uh, contracting COVID-19, um, many criminal defense lawyers have made valid arguments to say, please remove my client. Um, they have an underlying either comorbidity factor that the CDC recognizes. Mm -hmm. um, they are innocent until proven guilty. And let's give them some conditions or just release them on personal recognizance. And we've done that in some circumstance. I always call the commissioner if we're going to do it. Um, but there are other times, guys, where people that we believe are violent and dangerous have been released, and I have fought that all the way up to our Commonwealth Supreme Judicial Court to say, absolutely not, this person needs to be held. Um, and we've been successful and, and not successful, but we're going to fight every time. I, I, this is a very serious topic, but I want to make a shift to a picture. I want to show you this picture. And admittedly, this is from a couple of months ago, but this is our first opportunity to talk to you about it here in the OTR format. That is Commissioner Gross, who posed for this photo with the Attorney General Bill Barr after after a private meeting, the photo was plastered everywhere on social media. The, the, the basic question here, D.A. Rollins, is did, did, did the commissioner make a mistake? Taking the picture, was the picture a mistake? You know, 
I think one person in that photo, uh, which has two people in it, benefited greatly from that photo, and another person did not. Um, what the media hasn't picked up on is that very day that the commissioner was meeting with the United States Attorney General, I had convened a meeting of all of my chiefs, commissioners, and colonels in Suffolk County to discuss uh, race and policing in, a, a, as a result of the murder of George Floyd, and the commissioner was not present that day. Um, he is a grown man and can make his own decisions. I do want to say, though, that like the commissioner, I like to meet with people that are not in agreement with what I um, am you know, standing for, mm -hmm. because I think it's important that we always have communications. I never want to assume, I already know what Ed thinks, I don't need to meet with him. So are you saying, in other words, that um, the commissioner should have been at your meeting instead of meeting with No, Mark? no. The commissioner gets to be wherever he wants to be, and I don't get to control his but life. you would have liked to seen him at that meeting. What I can meeting. say is that meeting was happening, I believe, at the same time he was meeting with the U United States Attorney General, right? So whether we agree with what the United States Attorney General is doing, he is still the U Attorney General of the United States of America. And so, you know, we've all read the, the, the reports. I don't think the mayor even knew the commissioner was going to be meeting with uh, the United States Attorney General. So all I want you to have is information. Commissioner Gross and I have spoken many times, and I think his answer was, look, I don't agree with a lot of the things the attorney general does either, but I wanted to sit down and explain to him as a black man and a commissioner of the first police department in the history of the United States of America what my concerns were. And he is a grown up and could do that if he wants. DA Rachel Rollins is with us on the record.